my college plans. First, foundations. A foundation is a base or ground upon which something is built up. Psalm 127.1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build labor in vain. Jesus told a story about foundations. He talked about two foundations. One was made out of rock, and another was made out of sand. Both houses were built upon separate foundations. Only one foundation would be able to stand the test of time. And then the storms came. What are you building your life upon? Don't build your academic career at the expense of your faith. The majority of students who attend youth group in high school drop out of church and college. We're so concerned about this problem that we've developed a new program for university-bound high school graduates. The Boys College Worldview Study Certificate is a one-year program designed to equip students with the foundation for thinking biblically about all of the academic disciplines. At the end of the year, we'll fly all the students in the program to Boston, Massachusetts for the capstone course, Christianity on the Secular Campus. You'll have the opportunity to tour the campus of Harvard University and to hear from our guest professor, Bland Mason, the chaplain to the Boston Red Sox. Not sure where you're going to college or what you want to study? We're looking for students who are serious about the gospel, who want to enrich their biblical foundation for a lifelong impact. Don't build your academic career on a bad foundation. When I say, how's it going, you say, it's all good. How's it going? Man, your youth pastor is awesome. Chip Dean is the man. Anybody agree with that? You just want to like encourage him and... I'm, I'm a somewhat laid back person, but hanging out with Chip, man, he's just so energetic. Wow, he's kind of like Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> My name's Dan DeWitt, and it's an honor to be with you guys tonight, and I've heard about your youth group from several people, and I just want you guys to know that what you're doing here at Capshaw Baptist Church is really making news across the country about what God is doing here with you guys, that you would split your youth group between middle school and high school and like exponentially grow after that. I mean, it's just unbelievable, and I hope you guys realize how blessed you are to be here. Is this on? Are we good? Cool. Very cool. God is doing something unique with you guys. And one of the difficult things when God does something unique is often the people who are experiencing it don't realize how privileged and how blessed they are. So I just want you to know you've been blessed by God through this student ministry, through your student pastor, through the pastor of your church, that God is doing something very unique that a lot of people are talking about. And I think that's pretty cool. And I think God deserves all the glory for that. And so, and I, I mean that, and I'll tell you, your, your student worship band is probably, and you'll think I'm, I say this everywhere I go. I don't, I really don't. Um, this is probably the best student worship band I've ever heard in my life. And just to be honest, I was a youth pastor in Nashville, Tennessee for a few years, which is like the mecca of music, you know, it's country music at least. I actually lived, anybody know Tammy Wynette? She sang Stand By Your Man. I lived in her house. My wife and I lived in her house without her there. She, she died and uh, which is unfortunate and tragic, and I don't mean to make fun of that. Uh, but the church that I worked at was next door to her house, and the church bought her house, and my wife and I lived there for several months. Years and years ago, Hank Williams Sr. lived in that same house, and Hank Williams Jr. lived there as a small boy. Um, but anyways, that's all beside the point. I lived in a very musical city, and I just don't know that I've ever seen a student-led band as gifted as yours, so you're just really blessed. I want to, you can clap again, give it up for your band. <laughs> I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians. I want to talk to you about one word tonight, and that's the word identity. You guys live at a time that your identity is really being cemented more than, I would argue, more than any other time in your life. 
I mean, I think that the ages, from what I've heard from people who think a lot about this kind of stuff, that the ages one to four is one of the most influential times and you kind of put in, into to pattern certain thoughts um, that will be with you for the rest of your life. But I would say if there was another four years that's the most influential, it would be the years between your freshman year and high school year. Perhaps I might even bump that to be your sophomore year in high school through your freshman year in college. But this is some of the most influential and moldable times of your life. Actions that you do now are going to have consequences and effects, whether they be positive or negative, on you for the rest of your life. Much of what you're doing right now is going to determine the trajectory for your entire life. One of the biggest questions I've found that high school students ask, and I've worked with high school students for a long time, is really at the, the core, who are you? And determining your identity is, is perhaps one of the most important questions you'll ever ask. And we live in a culture that's quick to answer that question for you. What is your identity? And there's a lot of people that will tell you your identity is entirely tied up in how you dress or it's entirely tied up in who you hang out with or your identity is completely based on how much money your family has or what color you are or where you live. There's a number of things that the culture will tell you, tell you your identity is tied up in. But as Christians, if you're a Christian, you realize that there's one focal point for truth, and that is God and his word. And so if we're going to establish our identity on anything, we need to ask God who we are in his eyes. And so tonight, we're going to hold up the mirror of the word of God and look into it and see who we really are from God's perspective. And in Ephesians chapter 2, there are three things I want to tell you tonight. I want to tell you who you were, then I want to tell you who you are, and then I want to tell you about God's purpose for your life. If you are a Christian, tonight we'll see in this passage who you were, were before you met Christ, who you are as a Christian, and what God's purpose for you in life is. If you can grasp these three things, it will have a radical impact on how you look at yourself, on how you look at others, and how you look at your life in general. The Apostle Paul writes in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to those who to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. That's chapter one. I started in the wrong chapter and I'm not gonna just read all through verse chapter one. We'll skip to chapter two. I could be obstinate and just keep reading until I get to the text I'm preaching from, but I'll be humble enough to admit I started in the wrong place. Ephesians chapter two. Paul begins describing for them what they were like before they met Christ. And if you're here tonight, and church is new to you, and the idea of God is new to you, or maybe you've been in a church for a long time, but you've written, never really nailed down who God is and who you are in relationship to him. You've never made the decision to follow Jesus. If you were to die tonight, you don't have the confidence that you have a relationship with God, that you have the forgiveness of your sins, that you have the promise of eternity. If that's you, Paul describes who you are right now. If you've never made the decision to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, these verses describe how you are right now. But if you're a Christian, these verses describe who you were before you met Christ. Paul says, and you were dead. Everybody say dead. dead. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Okay, th th this is a complex Greek word in the New Testament. The Greek word simply means dead. It's not that complex. I'm joking. Dead means dead. It doesn't matter what language you say it in. Okay, where I'm from, um, where I'm from, people typically don't drive down the road and see roadkill and think, mm, that looks pretty good. I mean, across the river in Indiana, they might do that. Um, but in Kentucky, they don't do that. I'm sure they don't do that. In Alabama, um, <laughs> Well, Kentucky is suspect. I'll let you answer for your own state. Dead things stink. Dead things are not attractive. Dead things are not something that in any way are winsome or beautiful. Paul says, that's how you were before you met Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't say you were good and you just needed to have a better outlook on life. Paul didn't say, 
you know, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like you. Paul didn't say, you know, if you would just try harder, you could have your best life now. He didn't say, if you could just make better grades, you'd really be a good person. If you could just act better, be kinder, don't lie, don't, don't have premarital sex. If you just don't do these moral things, God will accept you. Paul says, look, when God looks at you, you were dead. That's who you were before you met Christ. That means you have no life. There's nothing in you on your own that you could establish a relationship with God. You are to God dead. Have you ever heard the expression where maybe a son or a daughter gets mad at their mother or father or maybe a a grandparent and they say, you are dead to me. Maybe you've heard where a mother or father would say that to their child. What an awful thing to say. You're dead to me. It means you have no relationship with me. And Paul says, that's exactly how you were before you met Christ. He says in verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. He says, not only were you dead, you were actually heavily influenced and ruled by Satan. I know you guys have been studying demons and Satan and demonology. Um, Here in this text, Paul says that a person that is without Christ, that they are spiritually dead and they are influenced and even ruled by Satan. Look at verse 2 again. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. So your lifestyle was measured by this world. You were living according to the cadence that this world sets. You were living according to the mindset of this world. According to who? The prince of the power of the air. Who's that? Satan. It's before somebody blurts out Jesus because that's like the answer to everything when you're in church. Okay, it's not Jesus. You know, back in the 40s, there was a group of, um, of really fundamentalist churches that misunderstood this passage, and they thought that it was the Satan because he's the prince of the power of the what? Thank you. He's the prince of the power of the air. They misinterpreted that, and they, they um, misapplied that, rather, and they said since Satan is the prince of the power of the air, then to use airwaves is satanic, and to have a, a radio broadcast ministry is satanic, and so they preached against Christian radio because Satan's the prince of the power of the air. Well, that's a misunderstanding of this text. What this text is saying is that, that God has allowed Satan to have dominion, not only over the air, but over the earth. This is enemy-occupied territory. You can go all the way back to Genesis when the sna- serpent lied to Eve and she ate the fruit and God's telling him. He said, he said to Adam and Eve, said, there's always going to be friction between you and the serpent. There will be spiritual combat until the day that Jesus completely crushes the serpent. And here Paul says, you were dead and you were ruled by Satan. Now I had, how many of you have had a goldfish for a pet? Okay. When that goldfish dies, which is usually like on the way home from Walmart, you know, you like get home and it's like, what? <laughs> really? They're only a quarter, you know, so, um, or they used to be. What do you do with a goldfish when a goldfish dies? You flush it, right? Like in Finding Nemo, they all lead to the ocean anyways. Um, you flush it. How many of you have a hamster for a pet? Okay, a few people. What do you do with a hamster when a hamster dies? Who said flush it? <laughs> Yeah, you may need the plunger to kind of finish that one off. Okay, you bury it. How many of you have had a dog that's died? Moment of silence. I've actually been to a pet cemetery. It's an eerie feeling. Yeah, so a few of you. Um, what do you do with your dog when your dog dies? Yeah, if you're wealthy, you bury it in the pet cemetery. If you're freaky, you stuff it. Um, Or if you're in a certain part of the country, you might eat it. Um, Okay, listen up. Quit telling your dog stories. Stop. I had a dog named Buffy. That's such a sissy name. And as a kid, I remember Buffy as being a boy dog. My parents have since informed me that Buffy was a girl dog. So we'll just refer to Buffy as the gender confused dog. And um, I was (laughs) joking. Um, 
I was a young boy, and I grew up in a small town. I'm from a small town. I really am. And they had one busy road that ran through the town. There were two churches and two bars, literally, populated by mostly the same people. And, um, and <laughs> serious about that, too. Um, and we had one rule at our house. Uh, we had several, but one of the rules that re- was in reference to Buffy was that we had to make sure we closed the chain link fence. And I remember the tragic morning when my mom came to me, and I have an older brother who's in Afghanistan right now for his eighth time um, serving at an army base in Kabul. And, um, and I have an older sister who's blind and deaf. And at that time, she wasn't legally um, blind, but she's completely deaf. So my mom sat us down. She's almost entirely lost her eyesight now. And, um, but anyways, that's not central to the story. But my mom sat us down. And so she's signing for my sister. And she's telling me and my brother, who are young young boys at this time, that someone left the chain link fence open, the little gate, and that Buffy, the gender-confused dog, made his or her way out the gate and made, made, Buffy made his way, her way, to the busy street, and Buffy was hit by a Mack truck. I don't know if my mom said Mack truck, but Buffy was hit, and, um, and Buffy was dead. And uh, I remember I, I was eating... Um, Lucky Charms, I think, which is the greatest cereal known to mankind. God's gift to us for, for mornings and um, that and Starbucks coffee. And I was sitting there with, with my Lucky Charms and there were tears running down my face and dripping into the bowl. As I thought about Buffy, I was quivering. Buffy's dead. And uh, that, it, that was around Thanksgiving. That was, that was the last time I saw Buffy again until later that spring. Here's what happened. <laughs> I'm from the Midwest, and around Thanksgiving in the Midwest, the ground's frozen. So my dad, being a loving father, wanted to give Buffy a proper burial, so he hid Buffy. My dad, being a forgetful father, forgot not only where he hid Buffy, but that he hid Buffy altogether. And uh, I, I was out that spring, and I was shooting baskets. We had a little goal on our garage, and I'm shooting baskets. And I noticed next to the garage, there's a pile of wood that wasn't there before. And just being a curious little kid, I went over and started picking up board by board. And (laughs) Buffy, (laughs) where have you been? (laughs) And uh, there are little icicles hanging from her nose. (laughs) And uh, okay, this is cheesy. Um, The only game that Buffy could play, um, the only trick he could do was to play dead. Um, yeah, the only, uh, command he would obey was stay. And, uh, you know, I would make, I actually was like making money, like charging other neighborhood kids a quarter to see my frozen popsicle dog. And, uh, you know, (laughs) the apostle Paul, when he describes your spiritual condition, he says, you're kind of like my dog. You're dead to God. God doesn't look at you. If you're not a Christian and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, when God looks at you, there's no life at all. There's nothing that you have to offer God. There's no chips that you can bargain with God. There's no value or morals that you can point to and say, God, you should love me. Paul says, you were dead. You were ruled by Satan. And then he says in verse three, among among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Some translations translate that objects of wrath. And the idea here is when God looks at you, he saw someone who was spiritually dead, ruled by Satan, and the only thing that God could give you apart from Jesus Christ is his wrath. One preacher a long time ago described this as though God, as though you are a spider hanging from a small thread and that God is holding that thread over the precipice of hell and the only thing sustaining you right now is God's grace. And unless you repent and trust Christ, all that you have to receive from God is his wrath. And that may make you mad, but let me tell you something. We all know that we deserve God's wrath. We are sinners by our nature and we are sinners by our decisions and our actions. And everyone here knows you deserve the wrath of God. 
And when God looks at you, this is who you were if you are a Christian, and this is who you are if you don't know Christ. Let me bring this home a little bit more for some of you who are Christians. Your aunt who doesn't know Christ, this is God's description of her. Your uncle who doesn't know Christ, this is God's description of him. Your mom or dad, your brother or sister, your friend in high school, how does God see them? He sees them as spiritually dead, ruled by Satan, as an object of wrath. That's who you were. Verse 4, here's who you are if you're a Christian. But God, being rich in mercy. Now, if you ever have financial difficulties, you're going to want to know someone who's rich in money, right? Like I've got problems. How many of you have been around some like rich people before? Um, and don't point if like they're here or anything like that. Don't make it weird. Um, but if you've been, okay, I was around one of the richest people I've ever met in my life recently. I met a guy, we, we use this consulting firm at our school and it's a consulting firm from Boston, Massachusetts. And um, there's a couple guys that actually lecture at Harvard University who, are, um, who own this company. Really smart guys. They're, they're um, not believers. And so was able to spend some time with them. And they invited me to come to Chicago and meet him in Chicago. And I thought, well, that's cool. And so I get this phone call from um, Dr. Samuel's assistant. Dr. Samuels is the owner of this company. And he said, I want you to meet me in Chicago and I want you to meet me at um, Wrigley Park. I got, well, that's cool. He said, I want you to go to the media entrance. And um, he said, I, I'm gonna have tickets waiting for you at the media entrance. So I go to the media entrance and I tell them my name and they escort me back. And I'm like sitting on a leather couch. I'm looking at the championship trophy and I'm watching a plasma TV that's showing what's going on on the field. And all of a sudden, this young man walks down. And I say young because I feel like I'm still young. He's my age, which for you is old. So this old man comes down <laughs> and uh, he shakes my hand and he is the son of the owner of the White Sox. It's Wrigley, it was the White Sox Stadium. That's not Wrigley, whatever stadium, it's the White Sox Stadium, I forget. And he shakes my hand and he brings me through the back and walks me around and we go back up and we watch the game from the owner's booth of the White Sox. And by the way, the owner of the White Sox also owns the Chicago Bulls. And then afterwards, I was able to go out for dinner with them. They are very rich. If I ever get in financial difficulties, I hope they remember my name. I would love to be on like their Christmas card mailing list, but they're Jewish, so I doubt they do that. <laughs> their Hanukkah list, whatever. Um, I'm joking. But check this out. If your greatest need is money, you want to know somebody who's rich. But if your greatest need is spiritual, all the money in the world will not help you. If your greatest need is spiritual, Jesus said it this way. He said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his own soul? And here he says, but God who is rich in mercy. If you're spiritually dead, if you're ruled by Satan, and if you're an object of wrath, here's what you need. It's not more money. It's not cooler clothes. It's not a nicer house. It's not nicer parents. It's not a better car. It's not a better opportunity in college. You need Christ. And here he says, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were, if you're reading along, say it with me, even when we were, that was really weak. Verse five, even when we were, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one should boast." What Paul says here is that you were spiritually dead. You were ruled by Satan. You were an object of God's wrath. But what God has done for you in Christ Jesus is that God took his own son, 
that God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son, his only born son, so that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, the, the Russians were first successful at sending a man into outer space. President Kennedy was not happy about this for some of the adults here who remember. And so America accelerated the space program and we were the first person to put a, a man on the moon. But the, the cosmonaut that the Russians sent into outer space was an atheist. And upon returning from his successful journey into space, he made the audacious statement. He said, we have been to space and we didn't see God or heaven. And his point was kind of twofold. One, he was saying, we didn't need God to build a rocket ship. We didn't need God to figure out the mechanics of how this would work. We didn't need God to figure out how to make it happen. We didn't need God to get there. So he was saying by we didn't see God or heaven in outer space. One, he was saying that science is supreme. We don't need God. We, we have all we need in science. The second thing he was saying is, look, if God's really up here, why can't we see him? We went further than we've ever went before and we didn't find God. One of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, responded to him in an essay called The Seeing Eye. And he said that for a man to say that expect to find God in outer space. It's kind of like Hamlet, who is the central character in a play written by who? Shakespeare. So you've probably seen the movie, right? Um, so Hamlet's a central, there is a movie, by the way. Um, but anyways, nobody's seen it, I guess. Hamlet is a creation of who? Shakespeare. Where does Hamlet live? He lives inside the play, right? And C.S. Lewis said, check this out. He said, if looking for God in outer space would be like Hamlet looking for Shakespeare in the attic of his home. He said, the only way that Hamlet could ever know Shakespeare is if Shakespeare was to write himself into the story. The only way we could ever know God is if God would write himself into human history. The Apostle Paul or the Apostle John said it this way. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came into his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But to everyone who did receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, It was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. But grace and truth was realized through Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time, John writes. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, Jesus, the only begotten God, he has explained him. The gospel is that you are not good enough to get to God on your own, so God has come to you. The Bible says that God took his only son and he nailed him to the cross and he placed upon him all of the sins of the world. Can you imagine with me for a moment if all of your sins from today were to be sitting suspended in like a, a big, ugly black ball in front of you? Every sin you've committed today, imagine that sitting right in front of you. How horrific that would be. How embarrassing if you could like look over and go, wow. Your sin ball is bigger than my sin ball is. I'm feeling a little better. 
But can you imagine if every sin that you've committed, whether in thought, in word, or deed from the last seven days was just clumped together and it's sitting out in front of you, how awful that would be. Imagine if every sin you've ever thought or spoken or done from your entire life was clumped together and sitting in front of you. Can you imagine how awful that would be? You know, there are times I get to the end of the day, this has nothing to do with sin, kind of. But if you're like eating so much junk food throughout the day, you get to the end of the day and you think, if all the food I've eaten incrementally throughout the day was piled together on one plate, like instead of like a donut here and a cookie there and a cheeseburger there and B-dubs here, what if it was just all lumped together, how nasty that would be? Imagine your sin. Now imagine... All of our sin just lumped together that we've ever committed. Now imagine all the sins of the entire world, of all of human history, of Adolf Hitler, all the way down to someone who just lies to their parents and everything in between was lumped together and in one consolidated moment in human history, in one isolated event, lumped on one person. That's what God did on the cross, that God put all of the sins of humanity on Jesus and God poured out all of his wrath on his own son. It's no wonder that the Gospels describe the sky going pitch black and Jesus crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then in this consolidated moment, all of the sins was being judged. I have a, we had a, a guy come speak at our college named J.D. Greer. He's a church planner. And he gave this illustration. He said, imagine if you're standing in front of the Hoover Dam, which is huge, right? Anybody been there to the Hoover Dam? Um, really big. All right, just take my word for it. It's big, a lot of water. And he said, imagine you're standing there and all of a sudden you see like a pinhole leak and there's water shooting out of that. And you think, well, that can't be good. And you see another pinhole leak and there's water shooting out of that. And then you start seeing cracks form in the, the wall of the dam, D-A-M, um, the wall of the dam. And so you see water shooting out and then all of a sudden the, the dam gives way and all of that mass of water comes just sweeping towards you and you will be swept away in the flood of that water. You will be instantly killed and it's coming towards you. There is nothing you could do to get out of the way. And then right before it hits you, a hole opens up in the ground and every last drop of that water is sucked into that hole and you're not even, you don't even get hit by a single drop. That's what God has done for you in Christ. He poured out all of his wrath and all of his judgment in his holy wrath. He judged Christ for your sins. And if you'll place your faith in Jesus Christ, you'll be spared from the wrath of God. And that's what the apostle Paul says. God has done for us in Christ. It is all grace. By placing your faith in Jesus, you receive God's forgiveness. Here's the final thing, and I'll close. So you have to know who you were, you were dead. You have to know who you are, you are saved by grace. Some of you are looking for your purpose outside yourself at the people around you. Some of you are looking within for purpose. And you ask, how could God love me? I want to tell you to quit looking within yourself and in those around you and look to a cross on a hill far, far away. Where is your identity? Your identity is in the fact that God loved you so much that he sent his son to undergo all of the condemnation and all of the damnation that you rightfully deserved. Verse 10, you have to know who you were, you were dead, who you are, you were saved by grace. And finally, you have to know your purpose. Paul writes, for we are his workmanship. Some translations read masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here's what it looks like. That God takes you from being dead and he saves you by grace and then he creates in your life a masterpiece. 
So your purpose is to do what Jesus said. And Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. What Jesus was saying there is what Paul is saying here. He's saying God is going to take your life and he's going to do such an amazing thing in your life that it is a masterpiece that people can look at and give glory to God the Father. But sometimes our life is more of a, a, a mess than it is a masterpiece. And I want to close with this last illustration. I am, I've always liked art. I've liked graphic design. I actually thought I was going to go get an art degree from Eastern Illinois University before I felt called to ministry at the age of 17. I'd love to tell you more about that if we had time. Um, but I always thought I was going into art, so I've enjoyed, like, man, I love this. This is all cool. I mean, whoever did this is awesome. I mean, it's really cool. Um, I've always appreciated, if I create something, I still do graphic design. If I create something and have it printed professionally, I could like, sit and stare at it for hours. Anybody like that? If I make something, I just want to sit and stare at it. I, I delight in it. And uh, I was asked to go back to the church camp where I trusted Christ, felt called to ministry, and to be a worker, to work, to help do stuff. And uh, because I'm kind of artsy, they asked me to do art stuff. And they had, this, they had this space theme, and they had this huge banner that was bigger than this back wall. And it looked like you were standing on the moon looking out at the earth. Oops. And they said, the stage looks awesome. The one thing we're missing is a UFO. And I said, well, I specialize in building UFOs. And, um, <laughs> and I'll tell you really quickly in closing how you can build a UFO too. So take notes. You need a few things. First of all, you need a church credit card. So see Chip. Secondly, you need a church van because you're going to need to haul all the junk you're going to get. And third, you need Walmart which is like an awesome place to go. And so uh, I had all three, uh, the credit card, church man, and Walmart close by. So I went to Walmart and I'm going through buying just all kinds of junk because I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I just know I've got a vision of a UFO. And uh, so I get back and I spread it all out and I've like got two of those flexible swimming pool things little kids swim in, you know what I'm talking about? They're like use a green or blue. Um, I bought a bunch of those like the, the styrofoam things you hit people with in a swimming pool. What do you call those? They're long and noodles. I got a bunch of those. I bought um, a two 10-gallon buckets, a clear beach ball, a ton of chrome spray paint. And so I get back there and I spray paint the two swimming pools and I bolt them together. And it looks like, if you know what this is, it looked like a giant whopper. Um, so it was huge. And then I cut holes out of the back and I spray painted those 10-gallon buckets black and on the in inside kind of a reddish orange so it looked like flames. And then I attached them sticking out of the protruding, out of the back of this big chrome whopper, these two 10-gallon buckets that looked like jet rocket packs. You with me? And I took the noodles and I spray painted those black to cover up the seam of the swimming pool. I attached them to the swimming pool with the greatest invention of mankind ever. Duct tape. And so I duct taped them, and so it had a bumper around the car that went back to the jetpacks. I spray painted over the tape so you couldn't see it. I put a license plate in between the jetpacks because even aliens need to be properly registered with the state of Kentucky. And I, I cut out a hole on the top, and I took that clear beach ball and I shoved it halfway down. So it's sticking out like a cockpit. You with me? I spray painted a racing stripe down the middle of the UFO. I covered it in cheesy Christian bumper stickers. And uh, it was the most redneck-looking UFO you've ever seen. And uh, any self-respecting alien would never be caught dead flying this thing. The one thing I forgot to do was to think of any creative way to suspend this thing from the rafters of the building. So we get there, and I realized that that was a problem. Because if it just sits on the stage, it's kind of like, you know, it's not too exciting. That wasn't a very good sound effect. I'll work on that. Um, so I went and got four little hooks with little bolt, like, you know, eye hook things. And a fishing line. And I started hanging my UFO up with fishing line. And I had an older, more mature, wise man come by. He probably had like a PhD in engineering. Or he was probably a rocket scientist, right? And um, he said, if I were you, I would not hang that up with fishing line. 
And because I'm artsy, that offended me. And I said, well, why don't you build your own UFO and you can hang it up however you want? <laughs> stupid, stupid. So we hang my UFO up and it, it looks like with four lines of fishing string and it looks like it's flying towards the earth. And this is awesome. I sat down on the front row and I stared at my UFO for hours. I just sat there and camp started at some point. And I look around, there's like, oh, there's people here. And there's like a thousand kids. And there's a band on stage. I've just been mesmerized. And um, the band starts jamming. And there's like a thousand teenagers who have driven in from all over the U.S. And they're excited, kind of like you were tonight. And they're rocking. And the praise band is rocking. And then all, I'm staring at my UFO. I'm like, everybody could see my UFO. This is awesome. It's just like the, the height of affirmation, you know. Um, and so I'm all excited, and then all of a sudden, snap. And uh, unfortunately, the only people who couldn't see my UFO was the praise man, which I thought was really unfortunate. They were missing out. And so they're like leading worship. We love you, Lord. And here's my UFO back there jiggling now. And I'm sitting there turning red, and I thought, well, it looks like a special effect, right? It's, we, we meant this. It's going to take off, kids. <laughs> it's going to be cool. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. And, uh, and I started to like theologically try to rationalize this like okay how many members of the trinity are there not four the four gospels but the trinity trumps the gospel so um there are three and i've got three strings now this is god's will for my ufo so i'm on the front row like god's so sovereign praise you jesus thank you getting rid of that four string um so, so i'm praying right and the praise man here's one of the things you have to learn i know i need to wrap up quick here's one of the things you need to learn People on stage is kind of like me, praise bands, speakers, preachers. We feed off the energy of the audience. And so if the audience seems to be kind of energized by something that's going on, we get a little more excited. The praise man didn't know that they thought people were getting moved by the spirit. So the more people stared at my UFO, they're like, there's something, the Holy Spirit's breaking out here. And so they're like getting more into worship while people are getting more distracted. And it was this weird cycle that was feeding off of each other. And so here's my UFO jiggling. And here's me praying. Here's the praise man just about to speak in tongues because it's like the movement of the Spirit. I'm not advocating that. And so I'm praying. <laughs> Sorry, Chip. Snap. Two strings left. And it's not just kind of jittering. It's wobbling back and forth. And uh, the praise man thinks that revival's breaking out. And they're like, hallelujah. And my UFO's just jiggling and everybody's staring at it. And I'm praying earnestly now. I'm claiming every promise in the Bible. Like you said, knock and you'd open the door. You know, seek and I'd find. Um, and then I went to like the really big one. Like, Jesus, you promised you could come back at any time. <laughs> right now would be awesome. Great. And uh, unfortunately, Jesus didn't answer any of those prayers. And... Uh, he will come back. He just didn't come back then. And so another string broke. Snap. And now my UFO is swinging <laughs> back and forth. And there are a thousand teenage heads in unison following it. They're like swaying. And whoa. And, uh, and the praise man is about to just have a Pentecostal fit on stage. Like, yes, Lord. And they're jumping. I'm like, wow. And, uh, and then the last string broke and my UFO rolled to the other side of the stage and exploded. Like into, there's like noodles and beach balls and 10 gallon buckets flying everywhere. There's a point to the story, I promise. I didn't create that silly UFO to be a pile of mess on the side of the stage. I created it, as goofy as it was, to be a masterpiece that's on display. And what the Apostle Paul is saying in this letter is that God has taken you from death, he's taken you to life, and now he wants to take your life and for it to not be a mess, he wants to put it on display. So that when people look at your life, they'll see how great God is. So the question for you tonight, are you living out that identity?